the session we will be having now is called devops culture simulation and uh, i'm very happy to welcome uh, dana pailaeva on stage the speaker for the session dana you're all set excellent yes i am okay. all right so i'm going to start the presentation and um i'm excited to be here today uh, welcome everyone um to get us started um you will need a couple of things and one of them is access to your phone if you don't have it we can make do with um the browser um but having the phone is better because we are going to start with a little uh, mentimeter questions and in order to access the mentimeter um you will need to go to this site www.menti.com and enter the code 2260513 or if you have a phone and that's when I'm saying that it's better with the phone because you can actually scan this QR code and that will get you right into mentimeter all right Awesome. So we have 10 people that have been on both sides. We have people from development, from operations, and we're a person who has no idea, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, too. All right. Looks like, you know, most people coming from development, some people have been on um, different sides. So I'm going to give um, a few more seconds for people to respond. And awesome. So we have mostly people from development. We have people from who've been to both sides. A couple of operations walked in. Welcome. And one person who has no idea where he's coming from. That's so cool. What if someone is not apps or from uh, development? So I guess that's a great question. <laughs> and I'm missing one of the options. Thank you for pointing this out. So I'll fix it for next time. So, um, yeah, then I guess, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm missing one option. <laughs> so I guess no idea is uh, going to be the catch-all. So that's uh, if, if you're not from apps or from development, or if you don't remember where you're from. So that's going to be um, that option. Okay, so then the second question for you. So welcome everybody. Be happy to see this diverse um, representation from different sites. And free bird, yes. <laughs> I like the free bird option for someone who is not from apps or from development. So that's uh, fixed for next time. Okay, and the second question for you is this one. What's your experience with DevOps? And just go ahead and type in um, anything that comes to your mind when you think about your experience with DevOps. And it could be anything from "I have no clue" to "I've been um, I've been working in the uh, DevOps organization for you know number of years." So anything that is right for you, that's the right response. All right. Very nice, and we're getting a nice mix of experiences, nice mix of backgrounds. Some people are just starting up, some people have experience, and that's really nice. It always has, it always have um, that um, additional um, benefit from having a mixed group of um, people, mixed uh, experience in the group. Very nice. Just been reading about it hearing about it, theoretical knowledge. Yes, so that's all wonderful because this session is going to be very introductory session. So if um, you've been doing it for a number of years, it may be too basic for you, but you know, I invite you to figure it out for yourself. If it's too basic, feel free to drop off or if you're finding it valuable, by all means stays. But this is going to be a foundational um, level um, session. And um, typically when I run it in person, it would be um, an experiential workshop. Unfortunately, due to COVID, I'm not going to be able to run the Lego and chocolate uh, session with you because I can't pass Lego and chocolate. But I am going to share the same um, information, the same um, learning. And uh, we are going to also um, talk a little bit about what are some of the um, experiential learning um, aha moments that people share when they run this session? Okay, so with that, 
Yeah, yeah. New to DevOps, mid of journey, reviewed a lot of project, no direct hands on conceptual level. So welcome. Welcome everyone to this session. I'm happy that you all are here. Okay, a little bit about me. My name is Dana Pulaiva. I'm an Agile and DevOps coach from New York. And um, in the past uh, 20 years of experience, I've worked with lots of organizations, uh, being on both sides of um, you know, this, um, this spectrum. And uh, I started as a developer. And as a typical developer, I was very shielded from what's happening on the operation side. And so when, uh, at some point in my career, an opportunity came up to become a DBA manager, I just grabbed the opportunity that is my both hands because hey, it's managerial position and um, I'm going to be managing DBAs. And what is there to know about that DBAs? I knew how to create tables. I knew how to write store procedures. So I figured that's enough. So little did I know that life on the operation side is very different from the development side. And so um, what I walked into was the life of uh, emergencies, um, you know, store procedures um, that are failing, <laughs> not just in the ones that are running uh, normally, but lots of emergency, lots of, um, you know, 24 by 7 type of availability, uh, pagers and um, you know, emergency that needs to be solved um, in a very short period of time. So that's what I was not aware of when I was in the development side. And so in a way, uh, by um, finding myself on um, development and operation side, I experienced a life on both sides of the wall of confusion. And um, if you... Actually, I'm not going to make any assumptions. Just um, let me know in chat uh, if you heard about, give me plus one if you heard about wall of confusion and give me minus one if you haven't. So plus one if you heard about wall of confusion, minus one if you haven't. Okay, okay, so we have a few people who heard about wall of confusion, but majority haven't. And that's cool because I love talking about wall of confusion. So wall of confusion, is it a term that was uh, coined by Andrew Shepard? And um, he specifically re referred to the wall of confusion when describing the disconnect between operations um, and um, development in terms of goals, in terms of um, procedures, in terms of way of working. And um, that goal missile alignment is the one that's uh, driving that um, disconnect and in a specific way. So if you think about development team, development team is focused on speed and delivery. Uh, most of the time in current situation, development team would be working in Scrum and um, they would be working in those uh, sprints. And as you probably know, at the end of every sprint, the goal is to deliver potentially shippable increment of a product. So what does development team do with that in traditional organization? They just throw it over the world to development for them to you know, deploy it in production at some point. And development team moves on to the next um, sprint. They taking the next stories from the backlog and the um, iteration continues. So that, that's a cycle of taking stories, finishing them up, throwing the um, code over the wall to operation and then moving on to the next um, set of stories. What happens with those uh, finished code, uh, finished stories, development team doesn't necessarily um, have any concerns over. They're done with development and they move on. So what happens on the operation side? Operation side is a life of emergencies, escalation procedures, and um, continuously being focused on um, stability and reliability. So as far as operations are concerned, um, keeping the lights on is the main goal, which means that anytime when a change is being introduced, it's a danger. Because with any new feature that development is um, throwing over the wall, they're potentially throwing a lot of bugs. And so the best way that operations know to keep production stable is prevent any deployments. So there is that, as you can see, there is that disconnect where development wants to get more code in production and operations want to reduce the number of time that we changing production. So um, in traditional organization, the best way to do it is to reduce the number of deployments. 
And that's where um, a lot of times when we are working with the traditional organizations, we hear that we have monthly deployments, we have quarterly deployments, we even have, in the past, we used to have one deployment a year. And so you can imagine that when you have such a massive deployment um, and massive amount of code being deployed in production, it's going to cause a lot of problems because it's just so massive. And so um, in the situation like that, when we have this disconnect of the goals, what happens is that uh, it leads to this low trust culture. And I'm going to share this formula because it really um, speaks to the point that when we have a low trust culture, we actually take longer to deliver anything into production. So if you think about the time it takes for us to uh, go from plan all the way to having things in production, um, any time when we don't trust all the steps in the process, we don't trust all the different teams that are involved, what we're going to do, we're going to introduce extra steps. So we're going to plan and we're going to replan, and then we're going to design and we're going to have architecture review. We're going to have sign-offs. We're going to have all these different people involved in um, going through all these different gates because we want to make sure that we are covering up for um, any possibilities of failure. So that's, again, traditional organization approach. This is not where we want to be with DevOps, but this is what's happening in a lot of organizations because there is a um, low visibility into what's happening across the entire value stream. There is low trust between the different uh, players in that value stream. And so as a um, prevention measure, as a, cover up, a covering up measure, we are introducing all these extra steps, which makes our process of getting things to the customers even longer than it needs to be. And of course, I'm going to tell you that DevOps is um, one of the ways to solve this problem. And um, based on the information that's coming from State of DevOps report, those organizations that introduce DevOps uh, practices and embrace DevOps culture, they're seeing amazing results. And so these are some of the numbers from um, what uh, elite performers are seeing. Um, they're able to do 208 times more frequent code deployments. So they're moving faster and they're um, achieving the goal that development team has. Um, more, more deployments and faster time from commit to deploy. And they're also achieving the goals that operation has, which is uh, faster recovery if incidents happen and a uh, much um, lower number of incidents overall. And so in a way, they're increasing speed and they're able to increase stability. So if you're wondering who are elite performers, so the way how um, State of DevOps uh, defines elite performers are those who are able to perform multiple times per day or on demand. If you compare that to traditional organization where deployments are happening from um, every half a year to every month, you see this huge disconnect between um, you know how many features um, the elite performance uh, elite performers are able to put in production, and how uh, few uh, features and changes um, the traditional organization are able to put in. And naturally, if you're hearing your company saying that we want to compete with Amazon, okay, and how many times per month are you deploying? one time per month. Excellent. So guess what? Amazon is doing 130,000 deploys per day, which is 130000. That's a huge number. And if you're doing it once per month and then doing it so many more times per day, then good luck to you being able to try to catch up with them and compete because they're going to outperform you because they're able to do that um, deployment more uh, frequently. They're able to address customers' needs better because they re-architected um, the entire infrastructure and they changed the architecture to be able to do that. Okay. And the good thing is that it's not only about um, doing things faster, it's also about um, releasing time um, that used to be spent on um, unplanned work, on rework, on fixing things, releasing that time and making it available for innovation. 
because any developer and you know we've seen uh, quite a few of them here today at this session every developer wants to work on something innovative we don't want to be working on something that's boring and we don't want to be stuck in maintenance we want to be working on the cool things and with devops you get that opportunity you have more time to spend on um working on cool things, working on innovation, because you don't need to spend as much time on rework and um, fixes. Another cool thing is that DevOps driving cultural change. And I'm sharing this information from the um, Interops DevOps survey. And um, as you can see on the top, um, mostly the changes are happening around um, development, um, becoming part of application deployments, also operations becoming part of the new products and feature development. So they are becoming uh, parts of um, the other groups, uh, processes, and um, they're sharing information, which is awesome. Another interesting thing that's happening, and it's on the very bottom, which, is, which means it's not as widespread yet, but it's a good trend um, that's happening. So salary and bonus plans for development QA and operations are aligned. So remember at the beginning, I said that um, there is a big disconnect in the goals, in um, you know, in performance um, objectives for these groups. So this is what's addressing that. So um, now that um, bonus and salaries are aligning, um, what's happening is that developers are not only responsible for coding their part and forgetting about it, they are also responsible for making sure that these things work well in production. And why shouldn't they? Because they actually know what they coded, they know how it works. And if something breaks in production, in traditional organization, operation is the one who has to respond to that. But they don't know how developers implemented it. So typically, the only thing that operation can do in that um, situation, they can restart the server. But it doesn't help to fix the actual problem. So in those organizations that um, merge the goals uh, of ops and dev, and um, they include developers into production support, um, what happens is that as a developer, we don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? So if that happens and our code breaks, you better know that we will fix it so next time we don't need to wake up at 3 a.m. And we know where the problem is. We know um, uh, what's causing it. And so we are definitely in a better position than operations to address those issues um, from production. OK, it all sounds like magic, right? And it's not surprisingly that, uh, yeah, the unicorn, everyone recognized the unicorn. So many companies that um, were using operation, uh, I'm sorry, using DevOps in the beginning, or they were uh, paving the path towards DevOps practices, they were called unicorn companies because they were doing something that no one else was able to do. And um, the very first company that started um, sharing some of the amazing things that they were doing was Flickr. So in 2009, they presented um, at one of the conferences, Velocity Conference, they presented um, their um, progress in this area and they presented this presentation at called uh, 10 deploys per day. And at that time, 10 deploys per day, it was something absolutely out of this world. It was magical. It was fairy tale like because everyone else was doing deployments every um, you know, couple of years, every 18 months, because we were all back then in the um, you know, waterfall type of world. And so Flickr was the first one to say that, hey, it's actually possible to be fast and you know, to be able to deploy things in production um, multiple times a day. Since then, um, companies like Amazon, Spotify, Etsy, um, they started changing their architecture and um, reorganizing the way how they work. And in, 2000, uh, in 2011, Amazon shared another number, which was 11.5 seconds, I think. So that was um, the time um, that it took for them to deploy, which is another amazing number. And since then, in 2020, it's no longer for unicorns. It's for large organizations also. It's for organizations who are able to um, not only um, 
play around in small areas, but they are organizations that are um, governed by um, all sorts of regulations, financial institutions, all these companies are um, able to embrace DevOps practices and um, you know, introduce DevOps culture. And I mentioned this number um, a little earlier, um, now, um, actually in 2018, so I'm sure now that the number is even higher, Amazon shared another number, which was 130,000 deploys per day, which is something absolutely out of the uh, normal people's world. But again, this is something to know that it's possible. Doesn't mean that everyone has to be as uh, you know, frequent in terms of deployments, but knowing that you have a way to deploy on demand or at a very high frequency if you need to, it's you know a good thing to know because that makes, uh, makes it possible for you to experiment with the practices in your own organization. All right. And what's interesting is that even now, some companies are um, shying away from DevOps because of many reasons. And these are some of the reasons that, um, again, came out from the survey. Um, the one that puzzles me is this one. There is still a confusion and lack of definition around the overall concept. And before I share my favorite definition of what DevOps is, I want to hear from you. So in the chat, just go ahead and uh, share your favorite definition of DevOps. And it doesn't have to be anything lengthy. It could be your own way how you understand what DevOps is. Because I know a couple of people read about it, a couple of people know it um, from the practice, some people are new to it. So just how you understand DevOps right now. Okay, thinking DevOps and operations, Dev automation and Ops automation coming together. It can do magic, yes. <laughs> Building the flow continuously. Okay, development operation plus DevOps. Provide value to end user. Mm -hmm. Let's do it together. Practices of Dev and IoT operations, development, testing, operations, security all coming together. I love that because, yes, DevOps, it's not just development and operation. It's entire entire value stream. And um, in some places, you start hearing DevSecOps, BizDevSecOps, BizDev. Um, set QA up, so it's like it's becoming unpronounceable. But the initial meaning of DevOps it was, you know, bringing the entire value stream together and being able to deliver um, end to end um, to the end user. And I'm going to share my favorite uh, definition. I like quick and stable. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Agile software delivery and operations. Okay, set of operations for iterative development, integration, and delivery. Yeah, many different. As as you can see, even from this group, we're getting many different definitions, and continuously integrate and deploy, bringing value to customers. Yes, yes, that sounds wonderful. Okay, I'm going to share my definition, my favorite definition. So my definition, but I, you know, it resonates really well with me. So um, it's about being mix of patterns intended to improve collaboration between development and operation. Um, DevOps addresses shared goals, shared incentives, as well as shared practices and tools. And it's important because, again, if we have multiple goals that are driving us into different directions, we're not going to collaborate to achieve something that in, is solving a problem for the customer. So here uh, it's about um, goal uh, Goals being um, shared, um, shared way to incentivize people for good work and um, processes and tools that are either shared or understandable by both sides. Because it's hard to learn all the intricacies on both roles. But what's possible is to extend your skill set a little bit to understand what's happening in the operation side. And, you know, how when you're as a developer um, building your code, how to make it more um, money, uh, how to make it more testable, how to make it um, such that it's easy to monitor, how to make it more secure. So knowing that information is helpful in um, you know, your own work. And same way from the operation side, if you know a little bit more about what development is doing, you can um, know better how to support the code in production. So having that ability to 
um, extend your um, skill set outside of your narrow role definition is something that is um, very useful in not only DevOps, but even in our own uh, little scrum team. We talk about the T-shaped skills, cross-functional teams. So very similar, taking that and extending it to the entire um, value stream. Okay, and uh, normally when we are on site, this is where we transition to actually playing the game. So we can't play it today, but what I can do, I can um, walk you through what is happening in the, in the game and uh, what are people discovering as they're playing the game. We do it in three sprints. And typically first sprint is when we are simulating uh, the way how traditional organization works. And I call it feel the pain because we start from um, every table being a separate uh, group and separate group representing a uh, functional group in a large organization. And so as you would imagine, lots of silos, lots of miscommunication, lots of information not being shared. And uh, second sprint is about introducing first steps towards DevOps and the third one we simulating continuous value delivery. And we have nine roles in the game. So every role has um, very similar um, type of responsibilities as you would imagine in a typical organization. And in addition, they have lots of dependencies. And so in the first sprint, they actually struggle a lot because they don't know who those people are that they depend on. They know there is a role they depend on, but they have no idea in the large room where to find these people. So just like in the large organization, a lot of times you don't know who is responsible for what. That's what's coming out in the first sprint of simulation. And so this is uh, the overall flow of the game. We have the business person who is uh, in charge of accepting and uh, placing different orders. We have um, Patricia Product, who is the product owner, and she works as the liaison between the business person and the development team. Uh, we have um, Danny Developer, who is building the packages based on what Patricia uh, tells him to do. We have Tester, who is testing the packages. And then once they're ready to be um, brought over or thrown through the wall to the operations, that's when you know um, things come into the operations world. And the roles that we have in operations, we have um, system administrator, Adam Admin, he is in charge of building environments, he is in charge of um, monitoring production. We have Sara Security, who is a security engineer. She is looking out for vulnerability security issues. And we have Robert Release, who is in charge of building deployment packages and deploying things in production. So as you can hear from the terms, very similar to what happens in the actual world, except when we are running the simulation, we are playing with Lego animals, we are building Lego animals as the uh, products and um, we're using chocolate as our user documentation. So what happens in addition to that? In addition to that, some players get secret instructions because just like in the real world, we receive information uh, and we not always share it in traditional organizations. We work with the um, marketplace board, and so this is where uh, the business person is in charge of um, not only placing orders, but also changing the price of those um, Lego animals through the game. So what that does, it actually shows um, to the um, other people in the room is that if they're not fast enough in delivering to the market, the market demand may change. and so. In a way, it's a simulation for um, the, your competitors can beat you if you're too slow. And so this is through um, the use of this uh, market board, that's what we're able to show. Okay, and this is how deployment package, development package look like. So this is little Lego animal, a uh, small uh, label in the package. The label is the one that Sara Security will be using when she's looking for security issues. And there is little chocolate and the package is closed. So that's what people are building. So what's interesting is that when we start working on this uh, game, um, a lot of times people are very confused in terms of um, what to build. 
And specifically, I don't give any instructions in terms of how um, a little dog needs to look like. And they expect instructions. They, ex they expect that people will give them specific um, instruction as to how um, it needs to look like. And the point of the game is that they need to actually talk to the business and figure that out. And that's another learning that comes from the game, that without that communication with the business, without uh, daily interaction with the business, uh, it's hard to build something that is addressing their needs. Deployment package is something that's, you know, it's put together by Robert Release and, you know, Sara Security is going to run the scan on it. And uh, what's interesting here is that, as you can see, there is a whole bunch of smaller packages in this large one. And um, in the game, when uh, Sara finds an issue in this large package, the entire package is going to go back to development team, which means that it's... A, Analogy for uh, when we are uh, um, building um, large deployment packages in our um, actual world, in our um, real life, and um, we are waiting for um, these infrequent deployments. What's happening is that we are introducing a lot of upper, a lot of potential challenges because when we have the large um, batches of code that we're deploying that's an opportunity for find more issues for having more issues because um as any developer know when we start merging large um you know feature branches we will run into merge conflicts and um, by the time that the large deployment uh, package comes to almost being deployed to production when we run security scans if the issue is identified it's much harder to find it it's much harder to troubleshoot it because now the time has passed from the time when it was implemented and until the time it was integrated and you know brought for deployment and so that's where um through the game again we're learning that um deploying things in the large batches is um, less productive than um looking for the small um type of deployments for more frequent but smaller deployments Okay, I'm going to take a few questions from the chat. So there is one, <clears throat> we know ample number of benefits of DevOps, but still organizations shy away from it. What could be the potential risk on uh, not uh, a promising thing about DevOps that keeps organization away? Yeah, and so um, that's what I mentioned that um, a lot of people, a lot of organizations are um, either confused in terms of what DevOps is, or um, they might be. Um, shying away from it because um, of the role security. So think about um, how uh, this introducing new way of working, um, some of the um, roles are going to change. And people who have been doing those roles for a number of years, they may not be happy about that. So um, sometimes it's a resistance that you're seeing uh, from those um, individuals or from those departments um, against DevOps because DevOps is changing the way of working. Just like any change, even though it might be a positive change for organization on the ground, individuals might be resisting the change. Okay. So um, <clears throat> when we start the first sprint, it's a cyclical value delivery with Scrum. So which means we're simulating um, sprint planning, sprint execution, demo, and retrospective. And um, in the first sprint, we have development and operations working as absolutely separate teams. And um, system administrator controls the schedule. Security tests run at the end. So just like in the real world. And this is how um, a room looks like when we run the game. So at the beginning of the game, as you can see, every table is separate and people are working at their tables. So even from the room dynamic, you see that they're all separate silos and they're not interacting between the different tables. Another thing is that um, this red table, this is where operations sit. And so these people at the yellow tables, they're all development teams. And as a part of the setup, um, every developer needs to get their um, environment configured. And in the game, we're just using the masking tape to create that environment. But the only person who has that masking tape 
is an operation person from this table. So when these development teams are about to start building their Lego animals, what they discover is that actually they can't do anything because they do not have environments. Does that sound familiar? In many organizations, when developers start, they have to wait for someone to build them an environment. Yes, I'm seeing lots of, lots of thumbs up. You're recognizing the problem. Yes. And that's what, in the game, it's easier to um, experience it, right? Because it's you know, much faster, much uh, you know, more visible as the um, you know, in the simulation. But um, when we're working in the real world, um, these are the things that are hidden. So we're waiting for things to happen. We're waiting for environment to be created. And so as developers, we're losing our time, right? And we are not satisfying any customers if we're waiting for the environment to be created. So that's another uh, challenge that DevOps is addressing because um, with DevOps, we're moving away from manual environment configuration that can only be done by a specific individual in operations. And we're moving away from that. We're moving uh, more towards um, automated um, environment configuration that can be built on demand. So any developer starting up um, in a specific group can um, build that environment on demand. Okay, I have no clue about DevOps. So I would like to know when do you know you have set up DevOps? Is there a blog book that would make me understand high level end to end process and steps? So uh, yes, lots of books about that. And um, I'm going to share um, a few of them in this session as well. And how is DevOps different from Agile methodology? That's that's awesome uh, question. So if you think about um, Agile methodology um, as it was intended to be, there would be no difference. Because one of the things in the uh, manifesto is that uh, we need to satisfy the customer with early and continuous delivery of um, valuable product. So it's... Early and continuous delivery, right? It's not about building and putting it on the uh, shelf. It's about delivering things to production, to the customer, satisfying the customer. So um, over time, um, unfortunately, what we are observing is that um, agile teams are focused on building more um, than on delivering. And so DevOps um, as a movement came to solve that problem because um, they're now taking what the development we're doing in terms of building things in the iterative manner and extending it all the way to putting things in production. So changing the processes that are there on the operation side, um, enabling that um, automated deployments, uh, in, in enabling continuous delivery. So automating that you know second part of the process that stayed between developers building the features and the customers actually being able to use it. Okay. So uh, lots of great questions coming in. So I'm going to move on and I'll take more questions um, a little later. So typical findings and debriefing of the first um, you know, sprint. Organizational silo, local optimization, missing market opportunities. And so um, what I mean by that is that in the first in first part of simulation, we actually get developers to build something. But the way how the game is designed is that we introduce um, code phrase, which only system administrator knows about and developers have no idea about it. So they keep building they keep building. And then when we do the debrief, the first thing I start from is asking them, so how do you feel about the first sprint? And every developer is saying, oh, we were so good. We delivered so much and we built it and it was great. And then I turn to the business table and then ask them, so guys, what do you think? Um, are you happy? I heard lots of been delivered. And business table goes like, what do you mean? We got nothing. And you can imagine the faces of people in the room because there is that big disconnect that becomes visible. And now developers locally, they were very productive and happy in their own team. But as an organization, we delivered nothing because of all the old processes that we were simulating in the first step. And so this is where we start talking about DevOps um, because the first part is just about simulating how things run in traditional organization. 
And the things that we introduced about DevOps is specifically the three ways of DevOps, basic principles of DevOps culture. This first one being system thinking. And I'm going to go uh, into all um, three of them in more details, but right now it's just I'm going to talk about all three together. So first way of system thinking. Um, and as you can see, this is a line that's go going from business to customer. So it's all the way, the entire value stream, looking at the entire um, process and optimizing it end to end. So it's not focusing on specific areas like, oh, uh, let's make work and development better or let's more make work and operations better. It's looking at it end to end. How can we eliminate bottlenecks in the process? How can we speed up the entire process in such a way that we're able to respond to customer demands faster? So the second part of it is um, amplify feedback loop. And so you see that error goes back from operations to development, which means um, giving information to the developers so they know how their things operate in, in uh, production. They know what are some of the issues that they, uh, the code is running into, maybe some scalability issues, performance issues. So giving the real-time data back to developers so they can act on it and they can actually create something that's um, more uh, usable. And the third way is the culture of continual experimentation and learning. And we'll go in more detail on this one, but as you can see, there are lots of little loops happening here, which means there is lots of learning, lots of iteration, lots of continuous improvement uh, over um, everything that's happening. So over different uh, processes, over way of working, over um, you know, different um, ways of solving problem. And that's where the culture of learning comes into picture because it's also a culture of um, safety. It's a culture of psychological safety where it's um, okay to experiment. No one is going to punish you for that. Even if you fail, that's part of the experiment. And so that's uh, that's okay to, to do. Okay. So let's look closer at this first way of DevOps system thinking. So uh, I'm going to show you this picture because um, to me it represents how uh, in many traditional organizations uh, processes and bottlenecks are happening between the different departments. So when you look at this and uh, you think about uh, the flow of value from all the way from um, when business is um, asking for something and delivering it to actual customers who can touch it and use it, there are lots of places where we wait. We wait for things to happen. We wait for approval. We wait for um, you know environment to be built. We, want, we wait for things to be deployed. So there are lots of places where there is an opportunity for streamlining the processes. And that's where when you start introducing DevOps um, practices in your organization, a lot of organizations fall into the trap that let's start with automation. And um, if you automate your convoluted process, if you have lots of bottlenecks in the process and you automate that, it's going to give you some benefit, but it's not going to give you as uh, much benefit as it can if you first look at how can I change the process to reduce the bottlenecks. And um, only after that, how can I automate it? But first, how can I remove those, um, you know, silo mentality? How can I remove those extra steps that they have in my process or extra approvals, extra bottlenecks, extra weights? How can I reduce that? And um, I love this quote from um, Phoenix Project by uh, Jim Kim. Um, Any improvements made anywhere besides the bottleneck are an illusion. And so that's what happens in organization, that's also something we discover in the game. Because when we try to make changes to development team who was already very productive and happy about delivering, uh, about building, our bottleneck is elsewhere. Our bottleneck is in deployment. And so making, making developers more productive or asking them to work three times harder, it's not going to change anything if the bottleneck is in deployment area. Your customers are not going to get anything. You will make developers working harder, but it's not the problem here. The problem is in deployment area. So looking at how can we solve the bottleneck there, that's a better way to um, you know, approach that you know, problem in the value stream for that organization. 
Any questions so far? I know I've taken a few. What is better for DevOps team, Scrum or Kanban? Oh, that's a really cool one. So um, with Scrum, you have this cyclical value delivery, right? So you have, even if you have a small um, sprint, it's still probably a week long. So um, if you're truly working in a Scrum fashion, then you're only going to be delivering every uh, week. With Kanban, you have that continuous flow. So you're able to uh, work on um, the small number of items at a time. So you have that work in progress limit and it helps you focus better. It also helps you get things um, into production if you have everything set up, right? So you can put things in production uh, without waiting for a specific end of sprint. So for some organizations, there is a mix of things where they use um, Scrum for um, development practice and um, for planning for having that cadence of specific events. And so they're able to um, retrospect in, at a specific cadence, they're able to plan for um, a specific sprint goal, which is helpful. But another thing that they do, they uh, can um, separate the planning part from the deployment part. So even though they're working in the sprint fashion, they're able to um, use the continuous um, delivery, continuous deployment um, in parallel with that. So in a way, it's become a more scrum, a scrum bun. All right, what else is here? Which practices is best practice for DevOps team to work when org have multiple development teams? Assign DevOps member to different team member teams. DevOps manager and managers assign work to the DevOps member, which come from different development team. So great question. And um, one, uh, the, the option number one, assign DevOps members to different teams. So that's solving one problem. Right, so it's solving the problem that you, you um, bringing the expertise to um, different teams, and so development um, that um, operations team member is available um, to help when needed. Um, another option, um, so the option with the um, manager assigning work, um, so that's something that I wouldn't recommend because in um, agile world, um, in DevOps world, we um, are encouraging self-organizing teams, which means that people are volunteering for work rather than a uh, development manager is assigning work. So that's already an anti-pattern. And um, another thing to consider is something that's, uh, that's called T-shaped skills. So that's helping people in the development team to learn those additional skills that they're lacking at the moment. So in this um, scheme of things that a member of DevOps team may become this um, Temporary, temporarily mentor or um, you know, person who will be able to help get up to speed, cross-train um, people in the development team to help them build those additional skills. Automation is another thing that's helpful here. So uh, the DevOps uh, team member uh, may help with um, creating, um, for example, chef recipes um, or um, specific scripts that enable that environment creation on demand. And then teach um, members of development team how to apply those recipes, how to use them to create the environments. Same thing with uh, building um, the deployment pipeline. So um, there might be um, a member of the DevOps team or the operations team who is um, going to pave the path. But then uh, the idea is that the more self-sufficient the, the teams, um, the development team become, the better it is in terms of their organization overall. Okay. All right. So yeah, fix your force bottleneck first. So what we do in the game next, we, um, so we have the conversation around the default bottlenecks button, and naturally in the game, we have lots of them by design because we want people to experience the bottlenecks so then we can start fixing them. And the very first bottleneck that we fix, I'm um, gonna talk about that, but we also um, bring things together in terms of um, this is the game, but what happens in the real world. And some of the bottlenecks that you see in the real world 
environment creation. And I remember mentioning it and everyone went thumbs up because that happens a lot. And so this is uh, one of the things that you know, when you're moving towards DevOps, one of the things that you need to look first, how to automate environment creation. And that's where you see lots of organization moving to, into clouds because it's easier to create a new environment in the cloud than to provision a new physical server. Because it used to be um, that you have to order a server, um, you know, months in advance, and then by the time you get it for your project, there is a lot of delays, lots of um, you know, vendor getting it into the data center, and you know, someone has to provision it, someone has to configure it, and so there are lots of um, not only waits and delays, but uh, also lots of. Um, dysfunction happening around that where people in operations or people who had contacts with operations would um, reserve um, space on the servers in advance hoping that you know whenever they needed the place will be available for them the space will be available for them what that was causing is that now people who need it couldn't get the environment so lots of dysfunctions were happening from that so we have moved to cloud that all goes away because now uh, you can um, automate environment configuration, you can provision it on demand. And so this is something that makes um, this bottleneck go away. Large batch size code mergers. I mentioned it a little bit um, in passing that every time you do that, you run into a problem that or uh, fixing any issues that are found in that batch, large batch size uh, code is going to be more difficult. Um, merge or conflicts, something that you know every developer knows when we're working on the feature branches, and this is something that a lot of organizations are actually moving away from. And um, with Amazon and Google, they actually have a um, master. Of, so everyone is working off on the uh, master branch because they're um, doing the continuous um, integration, and so um, every feature is not going into the long-lived feature branch. They are working in the way that, you know, the code check-ins are very frequent. And so that way, the entire code base can be um, in the ready-to-ship state at any time. Code deployment. Again, it's a bottleneck in many traditional organizations, and this is where they are creating that um, continuous delivery pipeline, uh, CI-CD pipeline, is something that's addressing the bottleneck here in code deployments. Test set up and run. Overly tight architecture. And this is the one that um, makes it difficult for many traditional organizations to move towards DevOps. Because if you have monolithic application that you have to work with, it's very difficult to think, how can I um, make new uh, changes in the small um, you know, size batches. Because if you look at the monolith, there are so many dependencies that it's hard to you know, change it in a small way. The, the many areas of the code are going to be affected. And so what many organizations do to overcome these bottlenecks, um, there are uh, at least two ways to go about it. So one is to stop everything and re-architect. And that's what Amazon um, has done when they uh, moved, when they achieved their first um, you know, uh, amazing number that they shared. Um, prior to that, they actually had to stop and re-architect everything. So the other way to go about it is something that's called triangular pattern. So uh, with that, um, the new architecture or new code is being built around the old one. And just like if you imagine the um, you know, large tree, which is the monolith, monolith uh, monolithic application, and you know this um, little new um, you know, plant that goes around the tree, and then eventually it um, strangulates the tree because it becomes more powerful. Um, the new plant. So the same analogy is here. You start building out the new application, um, the new architecture in a way that uh, it's eventually replacing piece by piece, it's replacing the older architecture. And so at some point, that new architecture becomes um, your um, way forward. And then the one that's been the initial monolithic application is the one that you're going to decommission. So that's kind of step by step moving away from this um, bottleneck number five. And my favorite bottleneck, people unwilling to change. 
So just like I mentioned um, in, in a few minutes ago, um, sometimes that's what's driving the biggest resistance to DevOps transformation. Because people think that with DevOps, like if I'm an operation and I know how to do things manually, now you come to me and you tell me, Dana, we're going to automate everything you're doing. How do you think I'll feel? I'll be resisting, right? Because I don't want my job to be automated out. So what's um, important to notice in this area is that um, this automating some of the manual tasks that operations is doing today, uh, we are actually helping them to not only um, create space for more innovation because they don't need to do that manual work anymore. They're also getting an opportunity to learn a lot of really cool um, new technology that comes with um, you know, DevOps automation. And they are um, having this opportunity to upskill themselves and become more marketable uh, in the um, job market because DevOps skills are very um, in high demand. And so uh, with the um, knowledge that operations have in terms of how um, you know all this hardware works and how to make it, uh, how to tune it, how to um, you know optimize it for production performance, um, all that knowledge it's not going to go away. They can reapply it in a different way using new skills and uh, new tools, and they're the position the best in um, you know, making it happen. So it's not that the job is going to go away. It's going to be redefined, and it's if you onboard with it, you're going to be in the best position to um, upskill and to become really marketable in the job market. So that's that. And... What we do in the second sprint, we change a few things. So we move um, security engineer into the uh, development team. And what that does is that now, instead of running security scans at the end, we start sharing information about security issues from the very beginning. And so that makes a huge difference in terms of um, how much better developers are able to um, you know, build things in the game, but also in the real world. And that's when you hear people talk about um, dev sec ops. This is what um, one of the elements of it is that, that uh, we're making security information available to developers from the beginning. So instead of testing at the end for security, we are um, building security in, or we're doing something that's called shift left on security. So that's um, one of the practices that you know, helps to um, deliver faster because now we are not um, stopping and rebuilding, uh, fixing issues that we find at the end. Instead, we are building them in such a way that they're secure from the beginning. And another thing we do here is that we um, do this exercise that um, simulates the um, building T-shaped skills. And so I'm um, going to ask you another question. Give me a plus one if you heard about T-shaped skills and minus one if you have no clue what T-shaped skills are. Okay, okay. All right, most of the people heard about T-shaped skills. All right, all right. And basically T-shaped skills and, and a few minus one, so I'll quickly explain what it is. So basically think about if you are highly specialized in one area, you have I-shaped skills. So just like letter I in, in English, so just, just like that, it's I-shaped. So it's like very narrow. If you have skills that are uh, in addition to your main skill, you have complementary skills in other areas that may be not as deep, but they're helping you to expand your um, your um, knowledge, but also um, helping you to be more effective uh, member in the cross-functional team. So then you have T-shaped skills. So it looks like letter T in English, right? So you have the deep skill set in your area and this, you know, sh shallow but very broad um, skill set in, you know, other areas that are complementary. And so uh, what that helps is helping with removing bottlenecks because if someone is, um, let's say, the oper we need um, specific operation skills in the area, but operation person is busy and others know a little bit about that, then operations person at least can guide others how to do it. Or maybe there's something small that others can help with addressing while operation person is focused on um, a more difficult task. So 
in the game, this is what's happening. These are people that are doing the cross training, they're doing the T-shaped skills. And you see the energy that, you know, it, that generates uh, because people are now connecting with other people in the room. And just like what's happening in the game, same thing when you are um, allowing people in your organization to build additional skills that generates energy and that opens opportunities. Because a lot of times um, when you have um, developers or operations or any knowledge workers who are um, stuck in the same role for years and years and years, they get bored. And um, if they don't see new opportunities for them within the current organization, they may decide to leave that organization and go elsewhere to find the new opportunities for career development, for, um, you know, progression, for achieving mastery, right? Because the knowledge workers, we know we're all um, more driven by intrinsic motivation, so autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So those are three things that we look for. And with um, having the um, opportunity to um, cross train, to expand the skill set, and maybe even move into different area of the technology organization, that's an opportunity that you're giving to your people in your company to achieve mastery without leaving your organization. So that's another uh, reason why you know building the T-shaped skills and encouraging that you know role blending, role switching, uh, expanding the knowledge is helpful for the organization because you're keeping all the talents in your pool versus um, you know seeing them leave and going elsewhere. Okay, a uh, couple of things that we do um, throughout the game. I'm using a lot of um, techniques that are called liberating structures that are amazing for debriefing. And um, I'm gonna share a couple of them with you. Um, again, because we don't have um, breakout rooms in the way how um, I could use them for liberating structures, you have to imagine how they work. But, you know, I encourage you to give it a try uh, because they are very useful in um, bringing everyone's opinion and everyone's um, ideas um, into shared conversation. So one of the simplest one is something that's called one, two, four, all. And this is where we start with one minute. Everyone's just writing down the response to a question. When we're doing the uh, debriefing, we are asking the question around the simulation, but you can use it for any other purposes. It could be a problem you're trying to solve in your current sprint. It could be something around um, questions for the next release. So it could be anything. But you start with one minute, every person individual in silence, just you know, writing down um, as many answers as they have or within that one minute. Then next, um, you're going to come together in pairs, and in pairs, you're going to talk to another person, sharing what you wrote on your little, um, you know, post-it or you know, piece of paper, sharing with another person your ideas. And this is where the structure is awesome for when you're working with uh, a mixed group, when you have introverts, extroverts, um, different level of seniority. It's awesome because it gives you an opportunity to uh, collect everyone's ideas, share them in a very safe way because you're just sharing it to the, another person. You're not sharing it out for the entire uh, audience to start from. You're starting from this you know, two people conversation. And in that conversation, you create more ideas because that's a lot of times when we feel safe, we are able to build on each other's ideas. And then next, you're going to go with your partner into another pair. And so it's now it's a group of four. And now again, you're talking to a small group and you're now able to bring ideas from every group and uh, think about what is the best learning, what is the best idea that we want to share. And this is an opportunity for extroverts now to represent this four people group because the next step would be coming together as all and sharing out what came out from these small group conversations. And so as you can see, we're building on starting from individual idea, then sharing them out in a small group and then coming to what's the best idea from the group. And then um, this way we're getting a lot of different ideas from the entire group and the group could be anywhere from, it could be as small as four people. 
but you know it also works amazingly when you're working with the large groups and um you know i use it a lot um when i do um, you know conference um you know, live conference presentations for just you know collecting questions from the audience because that way everyone got to ask the question not all of them were heard by me but all of them were heard by at least another person in the room and you know it makes that uh, so much more uh, engaging uh, for people in the in the audience but also it makes it safe so that's something to try um, when you're running it um, in your organization so some of the aha moments that are coming from this sprint too. And so I took a few um, you know, screenshots from the actual posters when I was running it. But as you can see, lots of people are commenting on broadening the T-shaped skills as a developer, more engaged with a product, more collaboration, more gets done. So again, through this simulation, they're able to see that um, positive effect of working in a different way instead of being a siloed now working together knowing more about what's happening in the in the other group expanding that uh, you know system level perspective and that brings us to the second way of devops the amplify feedback loop so this is where we talk about small batches because just like um, in the congested highway, if you're in the large truck or the large car, you're stuck. But, you know, as um, you all seen, I've seen it with my own eyes when I was in India. Um, if you are in a small uh, bike, you can move so much faster, right? You can just, you know, drive around all these different um traffic jams and you can get to your destination faster yes so same way with the code when you deploy in the small um in the batches this is how you can get through your pipeline faster if you have large uh, code batches that you're trying to deploy you run into many issues because there's just so many more opportunities for failure and another, um, so the faster you get it to production, the faster you're going to get that feedback loop because you're able to um, get it to the hands of the customer. So another thing about the feedback loop, um, so you might have seen this diagram. I will actually go and talk about that diagram. So um, CICD, that's another thing that introduces uh, the feedback loops. And the third type of feedback loop is giving information back to the um, teams um, from the live production monitoring. So I covered that. Uh, and then um, someone was asking about the books. So Continuous Delivery by Jess Humble and David Farley is an amazing book if you want to get into details of what is continuous delivery and how to implement it. So definitely highly recommend this book um, to, to get started. And this is a diagram by Jess Humble that I wanted to share because it gives a very good insights into different level of um, feedback loops that you get with continuous delivery. Just like you see in here, when um, the code get checked, uh, gets checked in into version control, it triggers the automatic um, testing. Right, and so then building unit tests um, are going to either fail or pass. If they fail, then feedback is going to get immediately sent to the developer. So developers are not going to wait for weeks or months to know that there is a bug. Immediately as they're checking in and the unit test runs, this is where they get that first feedback. So your feedback loop is closing really fast. So if unit test didn't fail and the build was successful, then it gets promoted to the next level, which is we're now running automated acceptance test. And the same thing here, if it fails, immediate feedback to the developer. So the code that you just checked in passed on the first step, but it failed on the other. So that the issue that you introduced was in that last piece of code that you checked in. And that's why, again, the larger the code that you're checking in, the more difficult it is to find the problem. The smaller it is, the faster you're able to find the problem and fix it and move on. And so next, same here. So if it doesn't fail here, it gets promoted to the next step and the next step and the next step. And this is where you see there is little approval. So um, 
these two steps could be done automatically. It could also be done manually because in some organizations, um, they don't um, need the um, actual production deployment to be done all the time. They want to time it with uh, specific marketing events. They want to time it with um, you know, maybe some other um, business-related um, events may require manual approval. But having an infrastructure that is uh, in place and you can, by the push of a button, send that code into production, knowing that everything prior to that was well tested and you know there are no issues and no security issues, so it's ready to be given to um, customer hands. That's what um, CICD enables you to do, okay? Live production monitoring by the teams. Um, we're talking about telemetry. We're talking about um, you know, having different uh, ways to monitor um, how your code operates in production, and not only monitor it by operations, but also sharing this information with the development teams. Sharing you know, how well the new feature that they deployed, how well is it being used? How well is, is it performing in production? Is it um, scaling well enough given the number of users that are accessing that feature? So again, not only it closes that feedback loop faster and it's useful information to developers um, to know how it's performing. It's also very rewarding uh, for the developers to see that, hey, the new feature we were working on, it's in production and look how many users are accessing it and using it. So seeing it in action that whatever they developed is being used, it's very positive feedback loop that helps people to stay um, energized about their work. So that's also a um, positive aspect of that. On-call rotation, having developers initially self-manage their instances of production servers. So again, different types of feedback loops. With on-call rotation, you get developers who wrote the code to be part of their on-call, which means that they have a page pager and if something breaks, they get paged and they will need to address the problem. Sounds very different from what we typically do in traditional environments, where there is that separation, segregation of duties, separation of controls. Here, we actually get that information into developers' hands because they are the one who knows how to fix it. And they also take responsibility about fixing it because, again, they don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? <laughs> no one does. And then and having developers initially self-manage their instance of, of production server, that's again, we're talking about with the cloud, we are able to do that because that way um, developers can um, run the code on the production-like environment. So it's not production, but it's production-like. So they, all the configuration is the same and um, potentially uh, any issues that could become a problem, they can be identified faster in this pre-production or production life envir like environment where developers have access to and they can you know, tune things to make sure that um, you know, things are working as needed. And so then um, that um, configuration can roll into production as well. And again, some people don't want to do continuous delivery for many reasons, job security, people are reluctant to automate. Antiquated processes, we've always done it this way, right? Have, have you heard that phrase before? We've always done it this way? Yeah. And this, uh, outdated understanding of segregation of duty. So that's something that's um, very relevant to many financial um, institutions where they have lots of um, you know, processes, lots of uh, audits, lots of um, governance in place where they need to um, respond to the auditors to make sure that they are limiting the risk. And segregation of duty is one way to limit the risk. And that's where um, when we move into DevOps, having conversation with the auditors um, and helping them understand how DevOps practices are changing the way how we minimize the risk is very useful because um, there are other ways to manage risk. There are other ways to make sure that no one is accessing, um, that an unauthorized person is not accessing production, that no one is going to bring harm into um, you know, the financially, um, financial uh, products and then everything is secure. We have lots of automations, which means we have lots of logs with the um, you know, continuous delivery and continuous uh, integration. And so 
through having access to that logs and then um, monitoring them and um, making sure that we're storing them properly, that can address many of the concerns that segregation of duty is addressing in the traditional organization. So again, involving auditors in redefining the process is something that's um, going to overcome that. External dependencies and fear of change, that's a big factor here as well. So it's unknown how that's going to work. And so um, it's scary. And sometimes um, if organization is um, coming from the place of um, pathological or bureaucratic culture, um, they are looking at um, any change as um, something that potentially fail can fail and failure is not an option. So in those organizations, introducing DevOps is going to be hard. So it's changing the culture as well. But if you're still not convinced that DevOps is the way to go, I'm going to share another insight, which is um, that's based on um, the Gartner, um, IBM, and Sonotype um, research. Um, it used to take 45 days in 2006 from the time that security vulnerability is discovered and to the time that it's ex exploited by um, hackers. So, guess what? From 45 days, it went down to three days in 2017. I'm sure now it's even less, which means that you know, if your organization is not set up to roll out new features or new patches, new security patches fast enough, you're going to be um, vulnerable to these type of exploits. So, again, you don't have to be an organization that deploys new features frequently because of you know, many reasons. But if you have uh, an infrastructure in place, you have practices and culture in place to be able to do it in the emergency situations, that's still a big step forward. Okay, yeah, I love the other comment in the chat. If something is not broken by fix it methodology, yes, <laughs> that's kind of along the line with, you know, we've always done it this way. Yeah, but just like what I'm saying here, uh, this, uh, the security issues may not be broken. You may not know it's broken. And once you find out it's broken, then uh, you may have very little time to fix it. So it's better to be prepared ahead of time, knowing that, you know, if um, something like that comes up, you're able to roll out new features, new fixes um, in a short period of time and protect um, yourself and your organization from exploit. All right, and then uh, the third sprint, what we do, we um, simulate reduced batch sizes, we simulate containerization and environment creation on demand. Again, it's all using um, you know props and Legos, but the learning that's coming from the uh, game is very real. And this is what's happening. So as you can see, remember that picture in the first uh, sprint when everyone is sitting at their own tables? So sprint three, everyone is working together. and People are standing because they're all involved. They're, um, I'm sure you heard the term swarming. So they're swarming on um, you know, this work. They're working together. They're engaged. They're involved in bringing business to uh, bringing value to the business. And so these green packages that you see on the um, right corner, that's all the packages that getting delivered to the business. If the first sprint nothing got delivered, then you know next sprint is um, actually. Um, they're getting the value delivered, okay? And the learning that comes out of it, uh, we do it another debrief. And that debrief, we're using another technique from the Berlin structure that's called fishbowl. And again, I'm going to talk about it, but I encourage you to try it when you have a chance because it's another way to bring out lots of ideas, starting from that one minute writing things down on a piece of paper to... Um, doing the second step, which is that fishbowl debrief. And this is where you have five chairs, one chair is empty, and then the other four people just, you know, whoever wants to talk, they can come out and, you know, sit in those chairs. And they start having conversation. We are debriefing on the game, but it could be anything, right? It could be, this, this is another liberating structure you can use. So they're having conversation with each other in the fishbowl. Everybody else in the room, they're observers. And they're listening into this conversation. They may give you know, questions that they will you know, ask when they're in the fishbowl. Because that empty chair is an invitation to join the fishbowl. 
And so the way how it works, anyone can jump in on that empty chair. What's going to happen is that the other four people that were in the fishbowl, one of them has to give up their chair. Because the rule is there has to be an empty chair at any point as an invitation. And so it creates this interesting dynamic that for one thing, people who are in the fishbowl, it gives them a sense that they're just talking to each other. It's like um, they have this conversation, they're debriefing, they're sharing what they found out through the game. And then others are almost like watching talk show, except you can actually join the talk show because that chair is available for you. And because he had written some of the things on the uh, post-its before going into fishbowl, it makes it easy for um, even the introverts to jump in because they don't need to think on the fly. They can just read what they had on their post-its. And that's already a way for them to contribute into this discussion. And again, give it a try because you'll see how valuable it is in bringing out different people's idea into shared space. Okay, and these are some of the things that come out um, during Sprint 3. So people comment on um, improving transparency, uh, more products getting delivered. Um, I love the harnessing energy and enthusiasm. You can actually feel that. You can see it in the room and it gets people excited about DevOps, it gets people excited about seeing that, you know, they expanded the roles. There is a little bit of confusion that gets created. It, that's normal because, you know, as we're learning something new, there will be an opportunity to be confused. But if you don't accept that that's part of the learning, we're never going to try anything new. And with DevOps, there is a lot of new things that you need to learn. And that's where organizations that enabling that learning culture are going to be the one who are going to win. Which brings us to the third way of DevOps, culture of continual experimentation and learning. And what this is about is about um, organizational learning, safety culture, and um, even doing practices like injecting failure to test resilience. One of the best examples in that space um, is what um, Netflix created um, as uh, something that's called Chaos Monkey. So give me a plus one if you heard about Chaos Monkey. All right, it seemed thumbs up. Okay, very cool. So Chaos Monkey is a special um, you know, application that uh, is designed to kill production servers at random. So just like something is working in production and um, you know things may fail, instead of um, trying to solve the problem when it happens unexpectedly, they run this Chaos Monkey application in the controlled environment, which means that people are watching as a uh, monkey is doing its uh, job and killing servers at random to make sure that if that happens, um, the application that has the business functionalities continues to um, work and continues to um, you know, serve the customers. And if it doesn't, then they'll looking for a ways to address it because everyone is now focused on that, right? Because it's done in controlled space. But that's exactly what this injection of failure means, is that injecting failure um, when you're watching, that way you can build your um, system in, um, in the way that is going to be resilient when things fail, when you're not watching. And that speaks a lot about, you know, culture of um, learning, right? Because it's expecting failure and being resilient to that failure and knowing that it's okay if we fail as long as we learn from it. And um, another thing, the safety culture. So um, if you've seen the uh, 2019 um, report of State of DevOps, um, if you read uh, the latest book by Jim Kim, um, it's called uh, Unicorn Project, psychological safety comes in front and center, front and center because this is something that's helping organizations to be more effective because this is something that enables us as individuals to contribute at the best possible way. Because we're not afraid, because we're not trying to uh, filter what we say. We're not trying to think about, oh, am I, I have an idea, but what if someone is going to think it's stupid? Mm, I'm not sure. So we're not going to go through all of that. We're going to share um, freely what we think and uh, contribute in the best possible way. And that will generate new innovation and uh, generate innovation and new ideas, new opportunities because of that culture that enables that, that to happen. 
very quickly some of you attended my session two days ago and you've seen this slide so this is um, my uh, version of run restrooms um, organizational cultures so three cultures types um, pathological culture where if things go wrong then the you know, organization is trying to hide it and then and punish the person who um, you know, found it or expose that Bureaucratic culture, we're fixing things locally, we're not sharing, we're not learning as an organization. And generative culture is where we're actually looking for opportunity to learn from the failure and share that information with others. So that's where practices like blameless postmortem happening. We um, Leaders are inquiring about um, you know, what was wrong in the system that caused someone to make that decision that was a wrong decision. So what do we need to fix at the system level versus who do we need to fire? So that's that's a big difference between the cultures. And so DevOps is um, thriving in the generative culture, and that's what enables um, these practices and this culture to be adopted, the culture of learning, culture of experimentation. Uh, and that's another interesting chart that I'm going to quickly share. So this is information about DevOps um, practices penetration across the different um, you know, practices. And what's interesting here is the question was asked to different um, people in the organization, people at the team level, management, and the C-level execs. And what surprised me and actually speaks a lot to that culture of um, you know, pathological or bureaucratic culture is that there was a huge disconnect between how uh, people on the ground knew how things are happening and what people on the top of organization thought that you know is happening with DevOps. My favorite one is this one. Incidents response are automated. So People in the C-suite think like, oh my God, everything is under control. We have all the incidents response that are automated and people on the ground know that yep, that's not exactly the case. So when that happens, when people are not um, feeling safe to share even information about how DevOps practices are being adopted in an organization, it's a problem, right? Because it means they're not going to share anything um, that's even more um, serious or potentially dangerous um, that C-level needs to know. So you have two ways, more fear, pathological culture, or more learning generative culture. And so DevOps is um, paving the way towards generative culture and more learning. That's what enables DevOps uh, practices to become effective because of this, you know, culture that is creating. And so in the chat, my last question for you, if you were 10 times bolder, if you had all the, um, you know, bravery that you can gather in the world, what big idea would you experiment with in your organization? Just think about if nothing was stopping you, if you were brave enough to do it and the culture was supporting you. So just give me a few ideas in chat. What would you experiment with in your organization? Four days work week. Sounds good. Chaos monkey. Yeah. Okay, ours. Okay. Self serves the team. Love it. Very cool. Very cool. Come on. I need more brave people in this chat. Come on, people. You're not saving this chat, right? So we're not going to share it with your employer. So just feel free to <laughs> come up with more ideas uh, to more ideas to experiment with. Knock down functional departments, make feature teams. Yeah, love it. Innovation. Yep. Yep. Bolts and banking and no sprints disruptive behavior. All right. All right. Yeah, very cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those brave souls who responded in chat. Uh, comp compete with Amazon daily delivery numbers. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. And there are some other books that I highly recommend um, you know, looking into. DevOps Handbook. This is one um, that, you know, if you want to read and get to know like how to do it, this is the book. 
if you want to understand why Phoenix project is uh, amazing for um, getting your head around um, some of the typical challenges in IT and how to solve them. Continuous delivery, I mentioned that already. Accelerate, another great one. A uh, fearless organization, that's the one that um, Amy Edmondson wrote about uh, specifically leadership practices that enable psychological safety. Goal is a fantastic book. Liberating structures, this is a collection of all the different facilitation techniques. And then by introduction to DevOps with Chocolate Lab and Scrum Game, once we get back into the physical world, you can read up how to facilitate the game. And with that, Thank you very much. You've been a pleasure to give the presentation to you. I appreciate everyone's uh, involvement and uh, brave ideas that were coming in. Thank you.